Hello and welcome to this episode of Retinal Realities in celebration of Women's Day. This episode is brought to you by Roche Products and is hosted by Claudette. Our special guest today is Marisa, a true example of how women continue to make such a positive impact on our world. Thank you. And welcome, Marisa. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, nice to see both of you, Karen and Claudette. Thank you. Retina South Africa has a management committee of eight and five of these are women, all powerful and passionate about making a difference in the lives of the hundreds of thousands of South Africans losing their vision to retinal conditions. One of the most amazing of these five women is our guest today, Marisa Jurgens. Welcome, Marisa. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm, I feel very welcome. Thank you. Marisa, you've been a part of Retina South Africa for many years. Tell us about your journey with advocacy and what your role, your loss of vision played in this amazing life you've led. I think becoming blind has changed my life. It has actually enriched my life. Uh, it has given me vision about uh, an, an interest in things that I most probably never would have been interested in in the first place. I got my diagnosis in 1996 and I was living in Chile in South America. And in South America, uh, Chile is a beautiful country in South America, but it doesn't have any retinal specialists. So uh, my journey of getting my diagnosis was very lengthy. Uh, I initially got... Uh, the wind of the possibility that I might have a retinal condition through my sister who was diagnosed here in South Africa and her ophthalmologist told her that it's probably a genetic condition and that she must ask her siblings to have tests done. I went off to have a test done at the University Catolica in Santiago de Chile, totally confident with the thought that there's nothing wrong with my eyes. And uh, uh, six, seven months later, I had uh, a, 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 the diagnosis when a professor from the John Hopkins Institute came down to Chile, and he then informed me that I definitely have a retinal condition. My sister was initially uh, diagnosed with a condition called Best Disease. Dr. Aronson, the doctor that uh, diagnosed me, told me that it's most certainly not best disease, but it might be some macular degeneration. And he th he originally said cone dystrophy. And he was the person that actually told me about retina South Africa. So it was an American ophthalmologist in Chile, in South America, that told me about retina South Africa. I then contacted my sister and I said to her, have she heard about retina South Africa? She said, yes, the doctor uh, Rulof at the Pretoria Eye Institute told her that she should become a member. But she asked him, what does retina do? And he couldn't really tell her what retina does. So uh, it was quite interesting that, he, you know, he, he, he suggested that, that she join, but he couldn't really tell her what retina does. But I then told her that Dr. Aronson said that this is such a wonderful organization that they were doing research to find a cure for our condition. And both me and my sister were then in our 20s and we were seriously concerned about, you know, passing on this condition to our children. At that stage, actually, I was diagnosed being pregnant with my second child and my first baby was just over a year old. So, of course, I was very, very concerned about how the condition is transferred from mother to child. And, and that was maybe the main reason why I initially joined Retina. But, you know, it turned out to be one of the best decisions of my life. I not only learned such a lot since I've joined Retina, it has opened my eyes about what is required when you go through this journey of sight loss, that there's so much that's needed. And it needs also people like myself and other women uh, like yourselves that's sitting here in this interview to get involved so that we can work first towards getting a cure for this condition but also to help people to live a happy and successful lives with their condition. That's amazing Marisa and I know you've actually worked all over the world in sight loss charities and NPOs. Do you think that's also helped to shape you and and propel you forward on this journey? 
it was interesting actually I, it it was really firstly of course uh, for my own benefit because when you arrive in a country for instance you arrive in a country and you don't really know where's the retinal specialists where would you get low vision services and later when i needed to get a white cane and things like that so i first of course knocked on the doors of these organ- organizations as a beneficiary, as a person that needed help from them. In in some cases, it, you know, it later turned out in, in that I also then would volunteer at those organizations. In the beginning, I did it because, you know, it was something to do. And as a wife of a diplomat, in many countries, you can't work. So volunteering is one of the best ways to keep yourself uh, active and engaged in the community when you're the wife of a diplomat. But with regards to, to the sight loss sectors overseas, I soon realized that, you know, that I might ha- have things to give as well from my side. It wasn't only that I needed these organizations to assist me, but I could also assist them by either using my own networks to help them fundraise or to build awareness about uh, the conditions that leads to sight loss to advocate on behalf of other persons with sight loss. And also, what I also learned is that by getting involved overseas, I can learn things that we we aren't doing in South Africa and bring it back home and tell my colleagues here, this is a way, this is another way how you can do things. And of course, amazingly, I would often bring things that we do here in South Africa and bring it overseas and tell my partners there, this is how we do it in South Africa. And many times, you know, they are amazed how what we can achieve with the lower resources that we have at our disposal and what we are able to achieve here in the site loss sector. Well, you know, you bring all that wealth of experience to Retina South Africa and to the country, but you're also very experienced in other areas. For example, you were on the Consumer Advisory Board of ICASA, where you actually represented the interests of people with disability. And I think that catapulted you really into the firmly into the field of accessibility for people with disabilities. Tell us more about this and your journey. Yes, this was a very interesting role. Um, ICASA is the regulator in South Africa that regulates the telecommunications and broadcasting industry. You know, they give the licenses out to all the companies like Vodacom and MTN and Telcom and any any telco. And also they regulate and give licenses to the SABC and DSTV and any other broadcaster, uh, even radio broadcasters in South Africa. And my role on the consumer advisory panel was to really look at how these broadcasters and telcos were including persons with disabilities. For instance, does the telecoms companies import smartphones that's accessible to persons with disabilities? Do the broadcasters use captions when they broadcast programs or do they use audio description? Or do they have any programs that caters for persons with disabilities? All of those things was my role at at ICASA to look in ways how I could motivate the industry to also uh, embrace persons with disabilities, to see them as a really viable market. In uh, worldwide, it is called the purple dollar, the money spent by persons with disabilities. Uh, that is the money that we spend on buying assistive devices and actually normal spend that we do. And worldwide, it is estimated that about 15% of, of the population has a disability. So you can imagine how what a big market persons with disabilities really is. And if you do not have programs on your television that can be accessed by these people, you are actually not allowing 15% potentially of your population not to get the information that everybody else is entitled to get. So my role there also gave me the opportunity to highlight the difficulties that persons with sight loss have 
in accessing content online and also on the television. And I was involved in the drafting of the very first regulations in Adikasa uh, to help all of these organizations, um, I mean, now the telecoms and the broadcasters, to get all their programs and their lives and, and their products accessible to persons with disabilities. Well, that's very impactful and it has far-reaching applications and results for people with disabilities. And that, that's an amazing journey that you went on. And then, of course, you went overseas to the UK and you returned after COVID in 2023 with your amazing guide dog, Dottie, who's such a special part of Retina South Africa. How did you happen to get her? Yeah, Dottie is is my eyes, my friend, and she's just so wonderful. She's an excellent guide dog. I went through the journey that every retinal patient go through where you sort of like cope with what is around you. You sort of, I mean, you don't really realize. I mean, people always ask me, how, how, do, how do you see? What do you see? And it's really funny because you don't realize when you have a retinal condition, how your sight goes lower and lower and lower, especially because your brain starts filling in for you. So for instance, when I drive to work every day with my husband, he often tells me, oh, all the grass is burned down. He hates August because everything here in, in Gauteng is burned down. You know, when I look at the grass, I just see beautiful grease, gra- green meadows. Because my brain tells me grass should be green. There should be grass there. So it's green for me. When I look at the sky, I can remember how the sky looked like when I could still see it. So to me, the sky always are beautifully blue and the most beautiful blue as well. Not even a, just a normal blue, just beautiful blue. And so every, every day is beautiful to me because I can remember it beautiful. And I think that's the big problem that you have when you have a retinal condition is you you think you are seeing and you you're not really seeing anymore. You your your sight is is more in your brain that is real sight. And I think that's what happened to me uh, when I went on a train uh, underground train journey in London and stepped off a train and thought I was following the the crowd out of the train station and actually crossed the entire platform and fell onto the tracks of an oncoming train luckily the train was still a minute away and they got me off the tracks before that train hit me but I was seriously injured my my I broke my ankle very severely and I was in hospital for for two weeks after an operation and I I then realized that Marisa you don't you can't see anymore you have to now accept that you can't see and although I was using a cane and I had a good mobility training and was comfortable using the cane, there is limitations to a cane because you can only use it on routes that you have learned. So if a where a mobility trainer or, or one of your family has actually taken you through that route several times and you have found all the touch points where you should turn, where you should go up and things to look out for. And the problem is that is not a real life. Real life is that you have sometimes go to places where you've never been to before. Otherwise, you lose your independence. And for me, my independence is critical. And I think that is why I decided to get Dottie, because she gave me back my independence. I can go anywhere with her. And that's the one thing that you can do with a guide dog, which you can't do with a, with a white cane. You can t- this morning decide, look, I'm going off to there, and your dog will get you safely um, the, uh, of course, you will need, you know, to, to follow a map and you need some modern technology to, to help you to follow a map independently. But you, you, you can't do that with just a white cane. A, a guide dog gives you a real independence. That's amazing. You are such a courageous person. You've now been appointed to the prestigious advisory board to the World Health Organization on Accessibility. This is such an achievement and congratulations on that. Please tell us more about this. Well, the World Health Organization in 2016, for the first time brought out uh, the 50 approved or 
what they called approved priority list for assistive devices. The 50 assistive devices, which the World Health Organization thought in 2016, if a country could at least give that to their persons with a disability, then they would be able to cover most disabilities. So that would now, of course, include things like a wheelchair, a white cane, and many other assistive devices that persons with disabilities use for all different types of disabilities. But you can think it, that was done in 2016, and today it's, it's eight years later. And I think assistive technology, you would agree, has really evolved over the last decade to become a more digital environment uh, where previously we would have a talking phone as a blind person, you know, and they were a talking phone to, which was specifically designed for persons with disabilities. Today we have a smartphone that is not specifically designed for a person with a disability but was universally designed so that make it possible for a person with multiple different types of disabilities to use that same device as an assistive device. So to keep abreast of this, the World Health Organization has appointed uh, 24 persons, which, which they call experts, from around the world. I was actually yesterday read the, the CVs of my colleagues, and I felt, I felt like, yo, I don't know if I deserve to be here because they have fantastic, fantastic resumes. The task of, of this group will be largely to redraft this 50 priority list for assistive devices, which will then be um, given to all the governments of the countries as an, a guide for what should be recommended to them to make available to persons with disabilities in their countries. Of course, depending on their own situations, and on their own budgets. But the idea is that the World Health Organizations give guidance to, to countries uh, around the world about what is the pro pro most appropriate way to handle uh, or the giving out of assistive devices or the making available of assistive devices in their countries. And this would be a tool to, to help uh, the World Health Organization in this process. Well, Marisa, I disagree with you. I think you have got just the right resume to be on that committee because you're not one of these people who approach it from an academic point of view. You actually live it and you know what works and what doesn't work. And you're aware of our situation in South Africa. And that's what makes you such a valuable asset to Retina South Africa. And we're pleased that you are our deputy chair. And if in a short sentence, what would you like Retina South Africa to do in the short term? When I joined Retina South Africa, we joked uh, on our board that the goal of our board is to actually close down Retina South Africa because we have found a cure for blindness. And I think that should still be our goal, that we work diligently to find a cure for blindness or to find a way that persons uh, with sight loss can live with their condition to have success, successful and active lives and that they are still able to be part and integral parts of their own communities and their own families and their own towns and businesses and wherever they are, that they make a mark because we have empowered them through the work that we do at Retina South Africa to be able to do that. That's the most amazing answer and we thank you not only for that answer but for your wisdom and your guidance and your passion within Retina South Africa and it's been an absolute pleasure to actually put spotlight on you in this our Women's Month and on Friday for our Women's Day. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And yes, Marisa, I would like to add my thanks to both you and Dottie for sharing your amazing story, but also for being such an inspiration for all of us who meet you and interact with you. Your journey and achievements and the way that you inspire everybody is absolutely exemplary. And thank you also to Claudette for your thought-provoking questions. And of course, a huge thank you to our sponsors, Roche Products, who make our podcasts 
available to everyone. Please remember to subscribe to the series by clicking on the subscribe button on this page. This will help to keep this very popular series going. All our podcasts are available on www.retinasa.org.za under the tab Learn. Thank you so much to all of you.